Welcome, everyone. We're so glad that you're joining us. I'm very excited to introduce our special guest today, Paul Levy. Paul Levy is an author, wounded healer, and founder of the Awakening in the Dream community in Portland, Oregon. He's a longtime Tibetan Buddhist practitioner and student of the work of C.G. Jung. Welcome, Paul. It's really good to have you here today. Yeah, um, I'm so happy to be here, really. Thank you so much. You know, I, I saw your uh, talk um, uh, online, though, uh, unfortunately. It would have been great to see it live, the one you did last year uh, through Sands. Oh, and wow. um, yeah, it was really, really striking, very deep and moving. And so I know in your work, you mentioned that quantum physics is pointing uh, at that dreamlike nature of reality. And for right. uh, our listeners, can you explain that a bit more? Yeah, oh, for sure. So quantum physics is, um, it's not, so it's actually empirically showing beyond any shadow of a doubt that this, this, this life we're experiencing is a dream, is of the nature of a dream. And not only that, but um, quantum physics itself, the insights that are coming through it are an expression of the very dreamlike nature at which it's pointing. So, and in real um, simple form, before quantum physics came on the scene, people, you know, scientists thought that this world objectively existed separate from us. And we were just the witness, the passive witnesses trying to understand this universe. And then quantum physics comes along and it basically um, showed that the, that the universe, that, that classical physics, pre-quantum physics was studying, i.e. the objective world, didn't even exist. There was no such thing. And that even, even beyond that, that the act of observing this universe actually influences the universe observed. The observer is the observed. And so that's the rabbit hole that, you, you know, that I went down in my book on quantum physics, because that really is a description of a dream, that the act of observing the dream, because what is a dream? It's, it's a reflection of the mind. So the way we are observing the dream is influencing the very dream and then, but then because we don't see that because it happens, you know, not sort of over time. I mean, it's happening over time too, but it happens instantaneously, right in zero time whatsoever. Then we become entranced thinking that this world we're seeing is objective and, and that sets in motion a whole unconscious process where we actually um, imprison ourselves. And I can, I would love to talk more about that, but I want to first say the implication of what I'm describing, you know, that quantum physics is actually showing us is that the act of observation is creative. Okay. And that's pointing at that. We have this unbelievably vast creative power at our disposal moment by moment. But to the extent that we're unconscious of that, then that immense creative power in a way gets turned against us in a way that's actually killing us, okay? And if I could just one, just, just to give you an example of how profound this, this insight is, just via the, the, the creative imagination, just imagine you're in a dream, right? And you're in a dream, and what is the dream? But it's, it's, it's a projection of your mind. It's, it's your mind, it's a, it's a reflection of your mind. So whatever perspective you're holding in that dream, instantaneously, like I've been saying, gets reflected back by the dream. So if you're holding this point of view in the dream, the dream has no choice being a reflection of your mind, but to just reflect back and offer you all the evidence confirming your viewpoint. So now you have evidence confirming the seeming objective, you know, um, actual sort of this nature of your viewpoint that you're actually, you have all the proof you need that what you're seeing actually is objective. So that makes you even more fixed in that viewpoint of feeling, well, I'm just seeing objective reality. And the more you have that viewpoint, the more the dream being a reflection of your viewpoint just offers you evidence confirming it ad infinitum in a feedback loop whose origin is within your own mind. And what I'm describing, that's basically saying that we have this genius power. We have this immense, we're these creative geniuses as far as shaping our experience of our world, but to the extent that we're not awake to it, then we become entranced by our own creative genius in a way that's killing us. And so what I'm pointing out, this is the solution. This is 
where the actual, um, the source of all the world crises, and this is where the solution is to be found. It's to be found within our psyche, within, you know, having to do with the fact that we have this unbelievably unimaginable creative power at our disposal, but we're unconscious of it. Very, very powerful stuff. And what I think of when I listen to these types of talks or consider these concepts is in my own dream life, when I have experiences of uh, lucid dreams or dreaming within a dream, like, I, you know, when I've, I've knew I was dreaming, but then I thought I woke, woke up, but I'm still dreaming, like layers right. of dreaming. So right. this dream-like nature of reality uh, yeah, yeah. is you can, yeah, you, you see it, yeah, re reflected to you uh, in, in the dream state. And uh, I, I always feel like this is such deep, complex stuff, and I can pull from my experience and my um, great excitement for the topic, but wow, right? It's like, it's, it's mind-blowing for me. Oh, it's totally mind-blowing. And what you're saying, I mean, because what I began having this experience that you were describing like in the 80s, in the early 80s, long time ago, and the experience I was having, and it got me in deep trouble because I was so excited about what I was realizing that people thought I had gone crazy. But I was, I was beginning to realize that, oh my God, this is a collectively shared dream. And think about what a dream is. What a dream is, is our inner process. What's going on inside of us is all of a sudden getting dreamed up and into physical materialization and manifestation in and as the seemingly outer world. So when I talk about dreamlike nature, the dreamlike nature of reality, what I'm pointing out is, and it's not just me who's saying this, every spiritual tradition is basically pointing at this in their own way. I'm just, you know, this just trying to translate it based on my own experience that what we're seeing in this seemingly in the world outside of ourselves is actually reflecting what's happening inside of us. And it's doing that symbolically. And symbols are the language of dreams. And so this is, you know, actually... Um, Jung calls this symbol having the awareness, symbolic awareness, that in other words, you like not just, you know, see your world in literal ways, but you actually cultivate symbolic awareness and you begin to interpret your experiences as if you're in a dream and as if you are dreaming what's happening to you, that opens up the symbolic awareness and you begin to have the recognition that what is happening outside in, in the world is actually expressing synchronistically. It's reflecting what's happening inside of us. And that's why Christ actually says, when you make in the apocryphal text, he says, when you make the inner as the outer, that's when you enter the kingdom. He was pointing at exactly this. So we're going to keep going down this rabbit hole because, yeah, I know you write and talk about how just like a dream, these inner and outer worlds are actually not different, but interconnected. And so can we go down that rabbit hole a little more? Absolutely. <laughs> totally. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. So you want me to decide that what do you have a particular question or? Well, I just want to hear more about, you know, your thoughts about this, because I mean, this is really like where you're such an expert and can explain this stuff beautifully. But I'm, I'm here really, you know, really absorbing it. And um, my mind is going in so many different directions with this. So, you know, I'm thinking about, I say, share with us whatever you like, but, but where I'm kind of going with this too, is with th this inner kind of outer relationship, what does that mean for what's taking place right now? I mean, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm here in California. Right. Wildfires are burning out of control. Right. Uh, we, yeah, yeah, know, yeah. I'm, I'm in Portland, and I, I haven't been able to go outside of my front door for over a week because it's so toxic from the smoke. Yeah, no, absolutely. And the thing is, is that in when you when you have a dream, dreams have like these multiple dimensions of meaning. And they're all true on, on their on their particular, you know, aspect of, uh, you know, and um, so, yeah, on the one hand, absolutely, we have to really, you know, engage with the outer world and put out the fires or heal all the outer problems. But um, part of what goes on 
to the extent that we don't have the recognition of the dreamlike nature is we actually invest our attention outside of ourselves, thinking that the source of the problem and the solution is outside of ourselves, and that's to distract ourselves. And so what I'm basically talking about when I talk about this creative power of the mind, that is actually, it's the, it's the, it's the part of us that is dreaming our dreams, not only at night, but it's dreaming our life. And, um, you know, so when you connect with that, you discover that we actually, like I was describing in a night dream, and we become entranced by the way the dream just reflects back, and we think it's separate from us. And then by thinking the world is objective, we've created ourselves as being a subject that's separate from the world. And, and then all of a sudden, and that's, that's the real trauma of being in the separate self. And then we become, then we react to our projections onto the waking dream or the night dream. And we, be, we, we become in this conditioned state and we're like spinning a cocoon that actually suffocates us. And, um, and it's all based on our own creative power that we don't know about. So I'll just give you like an example, how this actually has to do with, with what's happening in the world. Um, to the extent that I'm not in touch with my own, say my own, like sort of, um, you know, whatever you call it, shadow, say my own darkness, right? Well, in a dream, if I'm not in touch with a part of myself, what happens? Well, it, I split it off. It gets, I disassociate. It gets projected outside of me, dreamed up into and as the dream. As soon as that happens, now I have evidence that my shadow, that the dark part of me, that evil that I've split off from myself now is out there because I have somebody's carrying that projection. So as soon as I have the evidence, it's that same process I was describing where all of a sudden it, it, I become more entrenched and fixed in my viewpoint that, well, I am just light because the evil's out there. And then the more I see it that way, the more that the dream is going to give me all the evidence I need, you know, offering me people who carry my projection of the evil. And then what happens, it's really interesting, is then at a certain point, I try to destroy the carriers of the evil, which is an externalization of the initial inner process of trying to destroy and get rid of my own evil. So what I'm describing is that our inner process that's happening in us is now getting played out in the outer world, but I don't recognize that. And then the final part is that by me trying to destroy whoever is the carrier of, of the evil, you know, I actually have become possessed by the very evil that I'm trying to destroy. And that's madness. And that's why in my work, I'm, I'm always talking about that our species has fallen into a state of collective madness, you know, and that process of projecting the shadow. I mean, if you just, you know, just pay attention to politics, whether it's the Democrats and the Republicans or the whoever, whatever the polarized points of view, everybody is projecting the shadow, seeing the darkness outside of themselves is to the extent that any of us are not in touch with our own darkness, with our shadow. I mean, just think about it. You're in a dream and you're not connected with a part of yourself. Well, what's going to happen in that dream? You're going to split off from that, from that quality, from the shadow in this example, and it, you, you disassociate from it and it gets projected out, dreamed up into as and through the dream. And then into the dream, invariably we'll walk, somebody who will be the carrier of that projection. They'll embody that darker part of you that you've split off from. And, um, and then all of a sudden, as soon as they show up, you have all the evidence you need that the darkness, that the evil that you've thrown outside of yourself, that you've you know, not been in relationship to consciously within yourself, now it's appearing out there in the dream. And so you have all the evidence you need confirming the, your, your viewpoint that you're just light and all good and the evil is outside of yourself. And the more that you hold that viewpoint, the more the dream will just reflect the viewpoint because it's just a reflection of your own mind. And, and then when you amplify that process and you unfold that process, invariably at a certain point, you want to try to destroy the people who are carrying that shadow, that evil, because that's an externalization of the initial process in yourself of trying to get rid of and to destroy your own darkness. So just take a look at what I'm describing. Basically, our inner process 
that we're unconscious of is actually getting played out and acted out in full body form in the world. That's just like a dream where the outer is reflecting the inner. But by doing that, by trying to destroy the carrier of your own shadow out there, you actually become possessed by that very evil that you're reacting to and trying to destroy. And that's madness. And that's why in my work, I'm continually talking about that we as a species have fallen into a collective madness. But what I also point out is that when you see the dreamlike nature encoded in that madness, it's actually showing us something. It actually contains its own sort of this medicine and it's, it's showing us the dreamlike nature, which is to say it can potentially help us to wake up. So the very poison, that madness, is it's like a quantum phenomena. There's a superposition of states that it's simultaneously encoded in that energy is this evil and madness that can destroy us. And it's actually potentially helping us to wake up to the dreamlike nature and our place in it. And it all depends on how it manifests, all depends on if we recognize what is being revealed to us. A lot of things are coming to me, Paul, as you're talking about this. Of course, you know, this this very us, us against them, or, you know, this, this kind of polarization. And simultaneously, what's coming up for me is the idea of paradox. Yeah. And in my, you know, I'm, I'm reflecting a little bit on uh, when I was, you know, I don't want to, won't say too much here. I think activism is very crucial and important. But also when I was much younger, the type, I'll just say, of energy around the activism I was involved in was very, very polarizing. And it really kind of put me in, um, and this was through my teens and 20s. And by the time I was in my 30s, I, I shifted out, you know, kind of shifted a lot and got more in Tibetan Buddhism and 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 going down that mine more in my 40s. But, but in those earlier years, there was very much this polarization going on. And Yo, yo. You know, it, I, you know, I, I think it makes, can make us very ill. And yeah, yeah, well, that polarization and that and the body politic has never been as polarized as it is now. So just think about like, here's quantum physics, who's basically proven that there's no, there's nothing objective, whatever's out there, it's not objective separate from us. Well, if there's not an objective, you know, cosmos out there, well, then what happened to the subject? We as a subject need an object to, to be in relationship to in order to be a subject. If all of a sudden there's nothing objective, it's shining light on who we are. And that's the doorway into the dreamlike nature. Because, you know, when you have the recognition, like say if you have a dream, you know, tonight you have a dream and in the morning you, you wake up and there are all these, you know, characters. There are all these dream characters in the dream. Well, who are those dream characters? They're embodied reflections of parts of you. They're not separate from you. And that's the point of view. When you see the dreamlike nature, you see through the illusion of the separate self. And you recognize that we actually don't exist separate. We're interconnected, interdependent. This universe, quantum physics has, has shown, this is a quantum cosmos. It's quantum on every scale, the micro and the macro, and everywhere in between. And a quantum system, there's no separate parts. So that's, in other words, one of the gifts that's being shown to us by what's actually happening in our world, in that people are saying to me, wow, this is surreal, what's happening, it, it's like a nightmare. Yeah, it's a nightmare unless you recognize what it's revealing to us. And one of the gifts it's revealing to us is that we don't exist in the way we've been imagining we do if we think we exist as a separate self. Because as soon as we think we're separate, then we think that other people are others, are other than us, and, and then we, we're, we're in illusion. And, and that's the prime, in a way, that's the primal trauma, you know, that we can only heal by really, you know, by shedding light on us, on who we are. And, they, you know, these can be really tough concepts with, you know, the way we were educated, at least in, in the contemporary West and, and here, um, you know, where, where I'm from. So, yeah, these are, these can be really hard concepts. It, it seems to be you know really in opposition to individualism and yeah. these other ideas that we grew up with 
Right. And the thing is, when you say, and I, I understand where you're coming from, and I appreciate it, they're a tough concept, but it's not, it's not like a theory and it's not a concept. This is just, it's empirically, it's a, like the Buddha was saying, don't take my word for it. Just, you know, please do the experiment yourself. And the experiment really has to do with just, you know, to inquire into the nature of your moment by moment experience. You know, and you see, the key thing is when I was talking about, you know, quantum physics and then that's like, you know, it's an expression and it's it's showing us the dreamlike nature. And then I was pointing out, oh, yeah, there's nothing objective and the act of observing actually creates the universe. So the act of observation is creative. That's basically saying that we are unbelievably creative beings. We're creator beings. We're co-creator with the universe and um and the, the idea being that the solution you know one other way of articulating what i'm pointing at is that the solution to the world to the multiple crises that are converging you know is to get in touch with the creative spirit that is in touch with us 24 7 all the time but to the it's like we have this wand this magic wand that's fallen from the heavens and we all are carrying it, but because we don't know how to use it, it's like turning against us in the sense that it's killing us. What I'm pointing at is that it's not any, you know, just a, a nice idea or a concept or a theory. It's like, no, this is actually available to us. This, if you actually just inquire in the present moment, as far as your own experience, then the nature of your experience, you actually can help, but to connect just like a dream. The dream, what is a dream? We're creating the dream, not the I, the ego. No, that's, that's you know, a figure in the dream. That's that, you know, that dream ego. That's a model for who we are. Who we actually are is the dreamer of the dream. And, you know, and simultaneously we're being dreamed. It's a circular, a synchronistic, cybernetic, non-local, atemporal, acausal feedback loop that we're actually like, in and we actually it's generating out of our own infinite creativity and that's what i'm continually trying to point at that when any of us actually actualizes that or to whatever degree we do because it's it's infinite but then when we connect with other people who are also having lucidity and connecting with their nature and and tapping into their creative the creative spirits that that comes through us and we actually get in sync with each other and hook up with each other then we can change the waking dream we're having and that's what this is all about and that's evolutionary and a way to understand that is very simple in a night just through your imagination in a night dream imagine you're in a night dream you have you know recognition you're dreaming you're you become like having this you know, whatever, like lucid dream and then connect with, imagine connecting with other of your dream characters who are also recognizing that they're, that this is a dream and they're having lucidity and you hang out together and you trip out together. You contemplate, what are we realizing? We're realizing this dream universe that we thought was real and separate and solid and other than ourselves. We're now realizing that we're actually co-dreaming it into collective materialization. And once you have enough people who are like connecting with each other based on that realization, they discover, I imagine, that they could put that incredible dreaming power together and change the night dream they're having however they want, you know? And, um, and you know, of course, within limitations of, of how expanded their consciousness is, what I'm describing in a night dream, that's our situation in the waking dream. That's what's being presented to us. That's why I'm continually talking about how important it is to see the dream like nature. Yeah, that's real stuff. <laughs> I want to, I know I don't get to keep you forever here today, but I do, I want to ask, since you've taught, you know, you, you've shared this idea of profound creativity and mm -hmm. the, the, this nature, the nature of reality, I want to then uh, just shift a little and ask you about what that means for healing ourselves, let's say with yeah, disease no. or other issues that, you know, you've talked about it healing the, the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is healing ourselves because I, I'm really trying to stay with the inner outer piece, right. that connection there. But when it comes to, let's say, 
uh, people uh, suffering on on what appears to be a more individual level through disease or other um, types of uh, conditions or challenges. Can you guide us a little bit on? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With that? And, you know, so what I'm pointing out, you know, um, this incredible creative energy, you see, what happened for me when I had my, this, this awakening that I referenced in the early 80s, and I said it got myself, I got myself in a lot of trouble because I was so excited and ecstatic at what I was realizing. And I was, you know, in my, in my early 20s, I, will, I, I don't think anybody could have been prepared for you know, for what you know was confronting me, and I understand now something was being revealed to me, and what it was being revealed was the dreamlike nature, and what that means. I bring in quantum physics to um, answer your question. Now, quantum physics is saying that you have a quantum entity, and that's what this whole world is composed of. And before that quantum entity actualizes into form, it exists in a state of potentiality in any and every way it could possibly ever manifest it manifest it, it is existing in that in that state of potentiality and then we come along or any sentient observer and we observe that quantum entity and all of a sudden it actualizes into particular form and all the other possibilities they just disappear as if they never existed in a way going into like parallel sort of existences and what that means is that even if one of those potentialities before you observe it and the wave function collapses into materialization, even if one of those potentialities is, to quote a quantum physicist, highly, ridiculously, incredibly unlikely, it could still be this very next moment, the way this moment manifests. OK, so you see what that's pointing at. We have all the evidence we need that things are really bad. And it's like, oh, people get filled with despair and pessimism and depression. And if you're holding that viewpoint and being a dream, you're actually going to attract evidence confirming your viewpoint in a feedback loop whose origin is your own mind. And then you are part of the problem. But the point is, when you understand what quantum physics, you know, the hardest of the hard sciences is showing us you you would realize why in the world would I think that way? I want to hold my mind and my awareness in the highest way and dream up the highest possibility. And so it's not just like, you know, this is on all levels, helping helping the world, but also helping ourselves. And if we have these these diseases, well, it's known that people who have terminal cancer or these terminal diseases, sometimes literally get healed. That's pointing out that this universe, that the key possibly or probably even the most primary component of this physical world is consciousness. And that's once again pointing at that we're not awake to that. And that, that unawareness is getting reinforced in the materialistic culture that we live because people are under a trance thinking that the physical reality is the primary reality. And so they're in a way casting a spell on each other, which reinforces their own spell. And that's the collective madness. So what I'm pointing out is that when people actually really begin to wake up to the dreamlike nature, that's basically saying this universe is infused with consciousness and that's primary. And that's pointing at the incredible power, that creative power that we all have through our consciousness, how we interpret this inkblot being a dream, how we place this meaning actually influences the way the dream manifests. It influences our experience of ourselves. I'm always going back to connecting us with our incredible agency. And if you think about what's playing out in the world with the mainstream media, all this fear is being generated and people feel helpless. People just go sort of, feel powerless and feel like, oh, there's nothing I can do. I might as well just make the best of it. But, you know, that's to disassociate from their own agency. We are these unbelievable, powerful beings, you know, and particularly when we hook up with, with each other. So it's what I call, it's a true conspiracy. It's, it's we can conspire to co-inspire each other, okay? We can literally dream ourselves awake. That's one of the infinite 
potentialities that quantum physics is showing us. That's within the realm of the possible. When you understand what I'm saying, the realm of the possible expands to unimaginable degrees. There is no, the idea of being hopeless or despairing or depressed or pessimistic, there's no reason for that at all. This is critical information, Paul, and I really love your passion. And I, I want to thank you for sharing your wisdom today and allow you to spend some time sharing some final words with us. Any final thoughts about the dream? Yeah, yeah, no, thank you, totally. And um, yeah, so for me, like, here's the image that fell in my head as you were, because um, we all have this, this inner figure in us that's sort of like our guide. You could call it the ally, the muse, genius, or angel, or inner voice, guiding spirit, whatever you call it. There are a million names, and that's pointing at that it's really like a higher dimensional phenomena. And, um, you know, to the extent that any of us cultivate and, and really strengthen our relationship to that guidance system, which we all have, which a lot of us in our culture have been, you know, sort of, we, you know, not been connecting to because of the trauma of living in this world. And so to the extent that any of us can really heighten that relationship with that inner guidance, and of course, the inference is that I'm talking about going within and really being in relationship and differentiating that voice from just like the typical sort of monkey mind, which is the neurotic, worrying, thinking about stuff, that has a particular signature and frequency. But when you actually are able to differentiate that energy from when you're getting downloads, which we always are, from our higher self or whatever you call it, and you actually honor that, you know, then that really will will help you, that will support you, that will give you this guidance. And it has to do with finding your voice with with creatively speaking what is um, inside of you and whatever in whatever creative way giving shape and form to it and and part of that is coming out of the realization that wow we depend on each other for our own survival we're interconnected we're not separate and the expression the energetic expression of that realization is compassion mm -hmm. okay so don't underestimate the profound importance of really connecting and expressing and as best as we're able to embody real genuine compassion, don't underestimate the power of compassion. The traditions I study say that in a way, in a real way is the most powerful energy in the whole universe. So that would be what, I, what I'd like to say. Thank you so much. What a yeah, perfect way to conclude our talk today with yeah, compassion and knowing that the, the solutions within us we we can make a real real difference here yeah. i want to thank you for your time so much and uh for those that want to connect with you further awaken in the dream .com is a way we can reach you is that right right that's right that's my website with all my articles and interviews and my email and all everything you need awesome so good to have you here today paul and again i really appreciate your time and sharing all of uh, your wisdom with us well, thank you so much, really. Thanks, Kimberly.